Hello all you beautiful people. It's taken too long for me to get to this new video, but I wanted to talk to you guys about Levi's Shrink to Fits 501. We've already done a video on the 501, but the Shrink to Fit aspect is interesting and I want to talk about it because I recently shrank a pair. It was my birthday last weekend, is that right? I think so. And I decided as a landmark to finally shrink a pair of jeans that I've been waiting to shrink. If this all sounds bizarre, if you're wondering why you would shrink clothes, what the deal is with that, we can start at the top here. So basically cotton clothing shrinks. You know, you've probably noticed that when you put some clothes in, in the wash and the dryer and they come out, you know, tighter than they were when they went in. And the reason you don't see a crazy amount of shrinkage in most of your clothing is because it's pre-shrunk. Most clothing nowadays is pre-shrunk. There's an invention called sanfordization, a process invented by a man named Sanford Cluett. And that's a great thing about inventing something. You can give it your own name. So Mr. Sanford Cluett invents sanfordization in the 30s, which exposes fabric to very high temperatures and steam, and that shrinks the fabric. So by the time it gets to the consumer, it's ready to go. As I mentioned in my first Levi's video, my 501 video, the 501 was, was invented in 1873, like 60 years or so before the widespread use of sanforization. And, but it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. To understand the like role of shrinking in Levi's history and in clothing history more generally, you have to think about what the world is like in the 1870s in terms of clothing and fashion and how it's different by the 1930s. In the 1870s, we're coming off the Civil War. The Civil War was one of the first times that America took all of their industrialized power and turned it into making a lot of clothing. The small, medium, large size scale actually comes from the Civil War because they needed a way to, to demarcate what size everything was. Going back even further, some of the first times that clothing was mass produced, in America at least, was to clothe slaves. Southerners needed a ton of cheap clothing with which to clothe their slaves. They originally gave a fabric allotment to slaves and gave them time off to like work on that. But obviously capitalism being what it is, some slave owners determined that it was more that they could maximize the profit, maximize the brutality of it all by just giving clothes to their slaves instead of giving them the time off to make their own clothes. So as with almost all American things, it ties back to slavery, which is gross. But those two instances aside, so much of human history, people made their own clothes, right? Travelers from Europe to the US, the turn of the century, remark on how, in comparison to Europe, how it seems like America is a classless society. And that is obviously not true at the turn of the century. But to a European observer who is used to a really marked class system, the US was different because around the time, around the turn of the century and going forward, people are starting to buy things off the rack in the US. Off the rack meaning just clothes are in stores on racks as opposed to the old ways, which were still being observed in Europe, like poor folks make their own clothes, rich folks go to a tailor and have their own clothes made. A lot of fashion for so long was the relationship between a man and his tailor, at least men's fashion. And it was very much like, move that buttonhole up that much. The lapel should be this much wider. The pants should be this long or short. It was those small choices, those custom choices that defined fashion. So if you think about the amount of input that people had on their own clothing, of course, considering that poor folks were making their own clothing by hand, but that wasn't that they weren't necessarily doing any funny little fashion tricks with it. They just had to make stuff and get it over with and make sure it would last the winter or whatever. The amount of input that people would have on their clothing as compared to now or even, you know, later in America when people were just buying clothes. Turn of the century, early 1900s, Americans are able to buy clothes for themselves. Compared to what, compared to now, clothing cost a lot more. In the 1870s, when you bought a pair of Levi's, I've shared this fact before, it could be apocryphal, but as I understood it, a pair of jeans cost the equivalent of three days labor. That was the deal with clothing. It was, you, you, could, you could have clothes made for, you know, you could buy clothes already made, but it wasn't gonna be cheap. And for that reason, people wore their clothes a lot more, they had fewer possessions, etc. In this world, right, where in Europe, you know, people are still, you know, ready to wear is not so much of a thing. People are still relying, relying on tailoring, etc., or making things themselves. In America, it is more egalitarian in the sense that more people are wearing clothing. Obviously, Levi's in the turn of the century is not considered 
fashion-y by any means. And it's not something really people are lusting after, right? It's something that you have, you, you simply have to own if you were do certain kinds of work. Levi's is also based on the West Coast. So a lot of the people wearing it in this time period are West Coast based. You got cowboys in the Southwest. You got gold miners, of course, is the really famous example, silver miners. But folks along the West, West Coast, loggers, people like that are wearing Levi's. And a large part of that is this shrink to fit thing they've got going on. So what separated Levi's from the competition at first, and I also mentioned this in my 501 video, is that they use rivets. Rivets are at the corners of the pockets. Rivets make the garments stronger. People have been wearing blue denim for forever, blue jeans. And actually when Levi started making them, they called them riveted waist overalls. So I thought the, the term jeans came later, but actually the term jeans is, is used constantly. Jacob Davis, who designs the jeans, the rivet waist overalls, and Levi Strauss, his fabric supplier, helps him file the patent. They start making these clothes, and their denim shrinks. Their denim shrinks a full size because it is unsanitized, because there is no process that exists to pre-shrunk en masse clothing. People know that washing clothing will shrink it, but the, the really incredible thing here about these early jeans and also these early jackets is they're being sold in sort of strange ways. You know, it's not like you could just ri ride into the city and you go to the Levi's store. If you're local to San Francisco, you probably could. But everywhere else, you know, in the mountains, in the mines, in the in the on the prairie. If you want jeans, you're going to probably have to wait for some kind of traveling Levi's salesman in covered wagons, but you're going to have to wait for a shipment to arrive at your local general store or whatever, and there's no telling what sizes you'll get. And that's the amazing thing about the shrink to fit. They are making things that could fit the widest range of people possible. So for example, if you're a miner, a bigger guy, and you find a pair of jeans, you can just put them in cold water, like in the stream, they'll shrink a little bit, they'll come in to fit you, you're done. But if you are a smaller person, Person and you get the same gene, you could put it in hot water, like boil water, put hot water, shrink it down further. They're customizable in that way. The original Levi's uh, waist overalls did not have belt loops. They had suspender buttons because that was more common and they had a waist adjuster strap in the back. It's a detail you've probably noticed before, but it was to adjust the waist size because it's not like you're getting to get a 31, a 32, a 33, a 34. You're just going to get whatever the fuck they bring. So in that way, people were tailoring their own clothes, essentially. The pleats on an old Levi's jacket have become like a fashion detail now, but originally it was because if you were bigger and you needed your jacket to be bigger, you could cut out the pleats and it would expand the jacket. It would make it bigger. That's another uh, garment that also has the waist adjuster in the back. So, and what's really cool about the fact that Levi's still makes a shrink to fit is that is kind of the least fucked with product in their whole lineup. That has stayed pretty consistent. I mean, there have been many iterations of the 501, but the, the general thing is the same and the experience is the same. And if it doesn't interest you, you don't have to do it. You don't have to get that kind of product by any means. But but by soaking your jeans, you are taking part in this ritual that people have taken part in for 150 years. You could you could sort of transport yourself to any period of that time and find people doing exactly that. My grandpa told me that in the 40s, when he was a kid, what kids would do with their Levi's, this is another trick, is A, they would shrink them in the bath and, you know, going from like post-World War II, people wanted their Levi's really tight because it looked sexy. Um, I mean, I don't know if that was necessarily his thought process, but people would wear them on in the bath, shrink them. But what he would do with his friends specifically was that they would cuff the jeans inside inside of themselves to exactly the length they wanted them. And then they would stand in the bath and get that wet and sort of hem it that way because it would dry and it would be like stiff and it would hold that new cuff inside. That's because my, you know, my, his, his family was not especially well to do and they probably didn't want to spend any money going to a tailor. And I'm sure my great grandma could have hemmed it if she'd had the time, but she was like a single mom raising all these kids. Probably didn't have time to be hemming jeans all day and also they were kids so i bet they were they're growing it's just this level of customization that we don't really get to have in our garments anymore unless you are totally loaded and you get to commission something or you get to go to savile row on a trip and have a suit made we don't really have that experience of having clothes made for us and the really interesting thing about workwear specifically it is like the the most mass-produced garment so it 
it could be the most soulless, but because of the way it wears in, because of the way it molds to the body, because of the, the, the amount of time people spend in it, it becomes like the most individualistic garments that we have access to. There's a great book I, uh, that I am rereading called The Dandy at Dusk, which describes high-end fashion and, and designer fashion as this weird deal with the devil because you're not having it. it it's, it's, it's super expensive, right? And the only thing that differentiates you in that from someone else is that you have the money to afford it. It's not a matter of taste necessarily. It's not a matter of choice. You're not like commissioning something. And that any any old dusty vintage piece has a lot more soul than a modern designer piece because it just has lived. It's different, it's lived, and it's the 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 further you get from its inception and creation, the more life it has. There are, people still make unsanforized garments like the Levi's 501 Trink to Fit, mostly Japanese brands. So people t- still take part in this. And if you want to get really nitty gritty with what that does, not only does it shrink the garment to make it fit you better, it does a lot of beautiful things to the fabric itself. An unsanforized fabric, when you get it new, where it's never touched water, it's usually kind of gray, it's usually kind of flat, and you put it in the water, it comes out and it's like darker blue. The the indigo threads in the fabric have been saturated by the water. So the blue pops for the first time. It's usually kind of hairy and fuzzy. There's like neppy, there's a neppiness to the fabric. So the fabric gains a lot of character. But the most important thing is the fit. You can only get a pre-rinsed garment to fit so well. Like it's going to be a little tight. Maybe it'll stretch out. But a sanforized fabric is much more malleable once it's been rinsed than a regular fabric. And that's kind of the magic here. And what people have done since time immemorial with Levi's jeans is get them as tight as possible and they relax and they conform to your body. This is also the process with, with like leather boots, with leather jackets. You get something brand new. It conforms to you. And buying vintage jeans is much easier than buying vintage jackets, boots, etc. But it has had a journey on someone else's body and has thus conformed to its original wearer. It can only do so much with you in this cha- in the next chapter, if it's vintage. The shrink to fit aspect, I think, is also why jeans were so scandalous for a while. You know, in the 40s and 50s, many more people wore jeans. And that's because this West Coast brand, which, you know, had been so local to the West Coast, was carried. Servicemen were on the West Coast and saw Levi's, bought them. They were also sold at like, you know, kind of these general stores and army bases. And actually, the first time that there's ever like a mention of Levi's in like a large publication nationwide was in Vogue in the 30s, a women's magazine. And that was because in the 30s in the Great Depression, these women from the East Coast who wanted to take a vacation or anybody wanted to take a vacation would go to these dude ranches in the West. The beef prices went just kaput. And there's also the Dust Bowl. There are all these facts that caused the price of meat to go down and all these like cattle ranchers had no way to make a living except tourism so they invite dudes who are non-cowboys to their ranches to have this kind of like pseudo ranch experience and in vogue and other publications they advised women to buy levi's because you couldn't be riding a horse in a dress and they also targeted women because these western states had much more lax divorce laws and if a woman could establish residence, I think for like 30 days in places like Arizona, etc., on a dude ranch, then she could file for a divorce in that state, get it much easier. You can see that even in like a very kind of fancy ladies magazine, Levi's is as early as the 30s is associated with this kind of gender bendy thing. It's associated with the working class, kind of rough and tumble life. Post-World War II, which was the largest mobilization of men in human history at that point. There was just so much change. There was so much exposure to new things, new people, and the government in the 40s and 50s, the US government was really trying to get these men into productive nuclear families. I think that there was this concern that there was gay stuff going on, and I'm sure there was, right? So many men in one place for years, right? Of course there was, and we don't, think about it or talk about it but then going forward these men whether they're friends whether they're lovers are have these developed these bonds and they they are like in motorcycle clubs car clubs all these different things where they want to they want to keep spending time together these are their comrades these are their people america's really trying to get these men into productive normative families and you think about kind of like the tom of finland look and there's some stuff happening in this era 
You think about the wild one. You think about, and a lot of that, Levi's are a big part of that. And the thing about Levi's, right, is you can get them so tight. You can get them to fit really well. And if you, and like, looking at the kinds of clothes men wore before that era, it was not that kind of thing. And also, you look at the leading men before that era. Humphrey Bogart, uh, Jimmy Stewart, uh, John Wayne. These are not sexy men. These are kind of stoic, rugged men, but they're not sexy. They're not beautiful. And you're coming into the era of the Marlon Brando, the James Dean, the Monty Clift, these guys that were unabashedly beautiful. And there's a realization that men can express themselves in a different way. And there's a way that you can reveal yourself in jeans that you cannot in like a trouser, in a big pant. And I love a big pant, but there there is something transgressive about a tight pair of jeans. There always has been, always will. And that's kind of the shrink to fit thing. It's like, and there's kind of this like beauty is pain deal where you get them really tight. You got to work, work them out until they fit you right. But then they fit you right forever. And nobody's got a pair of jeans like that. And no garment revealed dicks and butts quite like a pair of jeans until that point. You know, other, other clothes have been really made to obscure those those parts of a man's body or anyone's body but you know another problem with levi's going international was that people on the east coast wanted the look but they were like what i have to shrink these i have to there's a button fly because lee jeans which is based in kansas from the get-go as or pretty much as early as they could started sanforizing their product so it wouldn't shrink. And they had a zip fly pretty much as soon as that was invented. So that would be easier. Um, that was designed for overall specifically for like outdoor work in cold environments because men would be wearing gloves. And if they want to take their fly down and take a pee, that would just be a lot easier than in like a big dense glove to like undo your pants for, you know, a button fly. And then in the 50s, you know, we have this new kind of, we have this, the consumer economy where, you know, people buy more things and... I digress. Too much history. You want to know how to shrink your jeans. I'm so sorry. That's like when there's a recipe online and you just were like, tell me how to do it. And they give you this whole fucking spiel at the top. Here's how you do it. So with Levi's 501 specifically, and you want to make sure that they're actually shrink to fit. A lot of Levi's 501s on their site are not shrink to fit, but they have some kind of like tag that says that just because that is historically accurate. They're going to be dark blue, in some cases black. They're going to be stiff and they're going to explicitly say shrink to fit or rigid is what they often say as well. There's no real point in doing this with Wranglers or Lee because those jeans are pre-shrunk. Some salvage jeans like the Levi's Vintage Clothing Collection are also unsanforized. A lot of Japanese brands are. And here's what you do. So with, with 501 specifically, with the 501 shrink to fit, the mainline one, not the salvage, nothing fancy, not Japanese. Find one that fits you in the waist, and if you want it very, if you want it slim, find one that fits you in the waist and is too long. It should be like two to three inches longer than your inseam. And then here's what you do: if you want it to be really tight on you, but you have any concerns that it'll get too small, put it on your body. The reason I wore mine in the bath was because they were vintage and they were '80s, and when I got them, they were smaller than I expected, and I knew I only had one shot. It's I wouldn't normally sit with them in the bath but I just didn't want them to shrink past my waist and make them impossibly small. But if you don't want them to be, if you don't want them to be as tight, then you can get just a size up in the waist. Size up in the waist, too long in the leg, and you can put them, usually if you're not wearing them, you put them inside out in the bath, weighed down, and then like hot. So the, the longer you soak them, the smaller they'll get, the hotter the water, the smaller they'll get, and the more you agitate them. You have to agitate them in the water to get to let the water penetrate the weave. All these things will cause it to shrink more. So basically, the least aggressive way to do it is in the bath. Then the next most aggressive way to do it is inside out cold water in the washing machine, no detergent. And then the most aggressive way is to do inside out hot water in the machine that's only if it's huge and you really want to shrink it down but then you run the risk of it getting too small you can always just like take it easy you know you can do you can do like a 20 minute lukewarm soak see how that does some kinds of denim require more than one soak but but i have found personally that with the mainline shrink to fits you want to get your waist size i'm like a true 31 in their stuff i bought a pair of their mainline shrink to fits 
like last year and the 32 because I was like, oh, I don't want it to be too tight. And it just never got small enough. I thought it was going to shrink a full size. And so it was kind of baggy, but I'm like, if I'm wearing a 501, like that new 501, I kind of want it to be a little tighter. So yeah, get your waist size. Then I would say probably like you wouldn't want to do too hot of water if it's your waist size. And then hang dry. You don't want to put it in the dryer. If you do put it in the dryer, it'll shrink even more and it'll lose some of that character. But again, up to you if you're just like too impatient or you left somewhere really cold and, you can, and it won't uh, drip dry. But it's summer. You could just put it out in the sun on a drying rack and let it do its thing. That always works. That is usually the way it goes. So just expect if you can also do this, which is what I did. This is exactly what I did with my 80s pair. Because they were so tight when I got them, I just wore them unwashed for a while, unsoaked for a while. And I wore them for like two months to stretch them out as much as I possibly could. I could have worn them for longer too. But the reason with unsanforized jeans, why you can't just never soak them, is <laughs> is they have that shrinkage is, is waiting to happen. And if you could, in theory, like not soak it ever, but if anyone in your house puts those jeans in the wash or anything, you're fucked because they have all, there's all this shrink there. That first chunk of shrinkage, once it's done, it's done. Your jeans will shrink a little bit more over time, but they'll usually let, they'll usually stretch back out. Once you get that first chunk knocked out, you're pretty good. So yeah, and then it's conformed to your body. The fit is awesome. The fabric has gained more character. That's pretty much it. I mean, there's no, I, I still love a vintage pair because you don't have to do the work and they're ready to go. Um, a vintage pair that has already been soaked, you know, might shrink a little bit in the wash, but what you get is what you get usually. The, that, it's just that first big chunk of shrinkage you need to worry about. A little bit of history, a little bit of a tutorial. Good luck out there. Show me how your jeans turn out.